This month, it's big, bold and blue, but can it really fly? We see the future for the Volvo Ocean Race. A group of teenagers with no links to the sea take on the world's biggest offshore race. And after 80 years, the historic and spectacular J-Class mount its first World Championships. But first, the practicing is over. Their next race will be for real, 45,000 miles around the world. So what's in store for the next Volvo Ocean Race? There were no points to be scored, yet the racing looked like the real deal. Apart from being a compulsory qualifier in the build-up to the 2017-2018 Volvo Ocean Race, this year's Fastnet race was the second of four practice races, making up leg zero. Winning counted for nothing in the overall stakes, but try telling that to the crews. I think uh, what I have seen uh, during this uh, Fastnet is, is going to be very complicated to win this Volvo because uh, there is a very strong team and a uh, very good navigator. In this one design fleet, a mistake costs you greatly, and uh, we just had that highlighted to us. But the whole race, it was really close. After 600 miles, just 39 minutes separated the entire seven-boat fleet. The relentless nature of the competition was an eye-opener to both newcomers and seasoned Volvo sailors alike. Looking back, I think every team still could have won uh, between the fast and truck in the series. One of the things for us to get ahead around is how close all the Volvo racing is. I mean, you don't lose sight of everybody. I said to Parco, mate, it's like a 700-mile match race. He said, mate, it's a 45,000-mile match race. The short sprint from Plymouth to San Marlo that followed delivered a similar result. Neck and neck racing, day and night. By the finish, Mapfrey had taken another win. The same head-to-head -head combat was underway in the final leg to Portugal until the breeze switched off and the race had to be shortened. Leg zero may only have been a rehearsal, but there was no time to waste in getting to grips with the competition. The real start was looming. It's a long haul, it's nine, ten months, and almost longer than that because we've started racing already and we treat it just as seriously leg zero as we probably treat the race itself in some ways. Leg Zero had been a reminder as to how tough the 45,000 mile, 11 leg race around the world is going to be. And some were already playing catch up. We have to knuckle down and, and use the time extremely effectively. You know, we're going to have to work very, very hard, put a lot of time in, make sure we, we don't ever skimp. We get out there, we test and we tune and we maneuver and we do everything we possibly can. It's easy to go sailing, but it's another thing to, to be really working at a level where you're definitely improving the boat. To add to the pressure, the stakes have been raised. Since the last race, the entire fleet has been refitted, remeasured and retrimmed to ensure the boats are identical. Lessons from last time as to how to make the new VO65s go quickly have now been shared throughout the fleet. The racing is already closer and gaining an edge even harder. The biggest unknown are the teams themselves. The competition, I, we know very well most of them and we know they're going to improve a lot. So we just need to keep thinking how to make the boat faster and how to sail better. For sure, Mapre was for me the favourite. He's very strong, so he sailed very well. So I think we'll have a fantastic race. I'm quite surprised about our, about our performance uh, in general compared to the teams that have been sailing for a long time. I think our manoeuvres actually uh, gone really well, uh, surprisingly well. Everything that we did well, we can certainly do better. <laughs> Everything that we uh, you know, didn't do well is at the top of the list for next time we get together. I think we have to be very happy with a second place, you know, in this last uh, race. Now you see how unbelievable close racing it is. It's very enjoyable and very stressful. But I think, uh, yeah, we are more than happy to uh, be able to fight uh, in the top in every race we've done so far. But there's a new wave of sailors too. From Olympic crews to America's Cup winners, a raft of decorated sailing rock stars have flooded in. Their immediate focus is elsewhere as they get to grips with their new world. It's all been a big learning curve for me. Um, and I've you know, enjoyed a lot, um, 
enjoyed all of it actually. It's uh, you know it's been great. So many different aspects of it. I'm just trying to trying to learn as much as everyone else, and no, I definitely didn't feel that comfortable uh, yet. But uh, just getting used to it. It's been a huge, valuable training miles for us. Learned a lot as a team. Got a lot of things to take forward. But the clock was ticking. The next start would be for real. First, an import race in Alicante. Then leg one to Lisbon, followed by the long haul to Cape Town. By then, the real deal will be underway for the seven teams as the points start to fill the scoreboard. Now sporting hydrofoils, the first World Championships for the new look NACRA 17 was a closely fought affair. After some close racing, the title went to British sailors Ben Saxton and Katie Dabson, who beat Spanish rivals Fernando Echevarri and Tara Pacheco by just three points. The Olympics are three years away, but it, it's, you know, it's just amazing to be world champion. <laughs> it, it's great, it's great to win. Also in the high-speed world, Dylan Fletcher and Stuart Biffel continued their winning ways to take overall victory in the 49er Worlds. Denmark's Jenna May Hansen and Katja Salskov Iversen took the 49er FX world title just in time for May Hansen to head off on the Volvo Ocean Race this month with Vestas 11th hour racing. Meanwhile, in the laser radial worlds, the battle for overall victory was between Marit Baumeister from the Netherlands and Belgian sailor Evie van Acker. After a tricky start to the series, it was Olympic gold medalist Baumeister who took the title with Van Acker in second. Lake Balaton in Hungary proved challenging for the Finn Gold Cup fleet with a wide range of conditions. Throughout the series there were several leaders, but it was Swedish sailor Max Salminen that won through to take gold by just one point over Jonathan Lobert from France. Beating Jonathan at uh, any event is a big achievement to win the world, uh, world title. He has been second a couple of times and now again, so uh, he's an amazing opponent and sparring partner. One of the best who push me each and every day. She's big, she's bold and she's about to fly. At 32 metres long and weighing 15 tonnes, the biggest foiling sailing boat in the world has taken a huge step forwards. Four years ago, Gitana 17 was a concept. Now she's for real. Launched this summer, she's taken a team of 250 people, 170,000 man-hours to create. Her ultimate goal is simple, to be the fastest sailing boat around the world. To do so means breaking new ground. There's never been such a big boat foiling, so there's a bit of unknown relative to what the environment is going to provide us. It's nothing like on the America's Cup where the foil is literally piercing the wave, then the boat is you know, fully out of the water. This kind of thing we're going to discover at a bigger scale. But it isn't just her size that's challenging, her foiling configuration is new as well. Two hydro foils and dagger board with elevator and rudder with elevator. So we have four points to lift the boat out of the water. Now we have to test it. So there was plenty at stake for her maiden sail. Would she fly? Prélu 2, Prélu 13. Prélu 13 pour commencer. Et on essaye de voir. On essaye de voir si ça vole. Top. Then, flight, stable flight.
coming up next. From inner city to offshore, how a team of teenagers took on the Fastnet race for the first time. Welcome back. Still to come, the spectacular J-Class mounts its first world championships and what the future looks like for round the world races. But first, they started from nothing and took on the biggest offshore race in the world. This year, a group of teenage students led by their geography teacher took on sailing's biggest offshore event, the Rolex Fastnet race. Until three years ago, none had any idea about sailing, let alone racing 600 miles offshore from Cowes to Plymouth via the southwestern tip of Ireland. And why should they? The Gregg City Academy is an inner London school in a deprived area. Landlocked at the heart of a crowded city, there couldn't be fewer links with the sea, and even fewer to sailing. But there was one. Project Scaramouche started in 2013 and it was my vision to try and get sailing accessible to students from my, the inner city school where I work. I've sailed all my life and I've seen the benefits that sailing can give of resilience and what you can achieve through, through hard work, cope with different conditions, so I hope to instill that sense of resilience in the, the boys that do the project. A project that was about more than ticking off a life experience. The Fastnet campaign was about taking another step into a new world, and they knew it. I probably would have been a bit confused because I don't think I would do anything in the sailing world because we're in an inner city area. And yeah, you wouldn't think of doing such a big challenge like that. At first, it was, I was just a bit overwhelmed because we've been building up for this for two years now. Their journey had started with small boats in Poole Harbour. From there, they progressed to an Etchells 22, before moving on to their 43-footer Scaramouche. Even then, learning to sail was just part of the process. Getting Scaramouche to the start line meant attracting support for their campaign. For Project Scaramouche to, to run, it's a bit like a small business, so they've learned how to speak to trust funds, how to deal with um, inner city uh, firms who might sponsor the project, and at the same time, they've had to develop their sailing skills as well. So the whole project is self-funded by the work that they've done, speaking to suppliers, international yachtsmen like Laurie Smith and all the, these sorts of very supportive people. By the time the Fastnet start came, they had a refitted boat and plenty of sea miles under their belts. The boys have done all of the qualifying races for the Rolex Fastnet race, so they are well aware of what the challenge is. I think they're a bit apprehensive about the amount of time that we're going to spend on the boat, but they've coped with all conditions before, um, and they've been on the boat for three days, two nights before, so I don't think the challenge is something they can't overcome. Race day saw the pressure build, but at least Cowes was familiar. They trained and raced their Etchells here and started their first major event in Scaramouche, the Round the Island race, from here too. But this was the big one. I'm excited to do the Fastnet. Big project, big race, 600 miles. Looking forward to it. The biggest ever Fastnet fleet was off. Project Scaramouche was underway. It's now 10 o'clock, we're getting up, going upstairs, getting ready to do our night shift. The first day was as I expected, but hopefully the days after this one aren't that bad. Getting ready to get some dinner now also. Around the needles, it was very tough, but this morning, the wind dropped a bit. It's going pretty well. It's been a little rough um, earlier yesterday, but um, we've all held through and no one's gotten sick so far. It's now 6 o'clock in the morning. There's Dan Zeng and now we're heading for the fast network. This leg was going to be a long one. Just a moment ago we saw a few dolphins. Due to the conditions we couldn't make a big breakfast, so we just had some porridge, cereal bar, some fruit and some water. 
So far, it's going quite well. When we get to the rock, the thing I'll be looking for is turning around, putting the spinnaker up, because I am the main bowman, so I'll get action into it. And that time was getting closer. So right now we're at the Fastnet Rock, uh, quite struggling to get around it because the wind keeps on dying and the tide keeps on pushing us up to it. So we've been doing a series of attacks to try and get past it and it looks like we might get past it soon. Three days after starting the race, they had rounded the famous lighthouse. The night before we rounded the Fastnet Rock, it was gusting around uh, 28 knots. So going upwind around about 12 o'clock at night, grueling very cold. I say that's the bit where you are pushed the most throughout the fast net. That was the highest part of the race in terms of difficulty. And the best moment for me throughout the race was rounding the rock and basically helming and surfing the waves back to Plymouth because I knew every wave that we surfed will take us much closer to Plymouth. With the spinnaker up, running downwind required concentration. As the finish drew nearer, their dream was close to becoming a reality. Um, I'm looking forward to a hot meal and, um, you know, some decent food and um, some rest. But overall, it's just been a great learning experience. And um, I hope to, you know, review what's happened during the race. Then drama as the spinnaker blew out. So the wind was picking up and, and we were saying like a long, and then the spinnaker was getting quite pressured highly and it basically just popped open. So then we had to quickly grab in the spinnaker, bring it down the hatch and just composely um, bring out the Genoa and just continue sailing along. So we roughly have 20 miles to go and I'm just gonna get an hour's kit for the finishing line of the fast of 2017. After more than five days at sea, they had exceeded their expectations, finishing 144th overall from 368 entries. An impressive performance. But this wasn't the end of their journey. Now that I've done the fast net, I could now officially say that I'm a lot more resilient because being able to cope on such a long journey, five days, is a big thing to do. For all of us, um, we're all going to do um, actuals for the rest of the year and some skyrim related stuff. But mainly we're doing actuals because we're preparing to do different races while out in Miami. And this could lead on to do doing other races such as the World Championships in 2018. The Fastnet had been both a challenge and a catalyst. For the Gregg City Academy, a longer voyage in sailing was now underway. In the 1930s, the J-Class had been designed to compete for the America's Cup. Back then, they were the most advanced yachts of the day. 80 years later, and America's Cup technology has advanced many times over. And as the Jays enjoy a renaissance, with more afloat today than at any time in their history, they too have embraced modern day thinking. With their elegant lines, they've adopted the very latest technology remaining true to the original America's Cup concept. Newport, Rhode Island provided a fitting location for the class's inaugural World Championships. The Jays first raced here in 1930, when the America's Cup venue moved from New York City to Narragansett Bay. Almost a century later, Lionheart proved that consistency was the route to success. Despite only taking one win, she never finished worse than third in the seven race series. A performance that delivered the overall title among the six boat fleet. I think it was already that last leg where we knew uh, something would go terribly wrong if we would not win the championship, but it's, you know, it's not over until, until you finished. 
but I think it was just a, a huge relief of everybody. We've been working so hard uh, for, for winning this championship and uh, of course especially happy uh, for our owners who gave us the opportunity, gave us the trust to race this uh, magnificent boat with, with this fantastic team. But while the honour and prestige was clear to see, the spectacle for all remained priceless. If the Volvo Ocean Race around the world wasn't tough enough, some are already looking at how to up the ante. As the current fleet set off on the first leg of the 45,000 mile race, plans were already underway for the next event. Oh, behind the doors here we've got the future of the Volvo Ocean Race and uh, we've, we've got a mock-up back here of the beginnings of what's going to be the next edition of uh, what's going to be race around the world. So at the moment it's going to be known as the Super 60 and there's some amazing minds sitting on the other side of here right now. Some of the best in the business that are putting together and formulating what is going to be a quantum leap from the current boats that we're using now. And this is going to be a very, very challenging boat to sail. The sailors are going to have to really adapt and step up to it. I think there's going to be five trim tabs you know, between the rudders and on keel fins and curved dagger boards that hang out the side. We are able to bring a lot of things into this which are banned by other classes and rules and, and apply that around the world. It's going to be eight tonnes and the old boats are almost 13 and it's going to, it's, it's going to be flying above the water. But anything that flies has to land so, you know, and it's got to get it around the world, you know, it has to be safe for the guys. So this is the reason for the mock-up and having a lot of people coming to visit to get their thoughts as to how this might work. You can sit here and envisage it. And the key to this whole thing is future-proofing ourselves and making sure that we're going to be able to adapt the technologies of sailing in the future as well. So you know, it's, to do that, you've got to pull together the greatest minds of the sport. Next month, Maxis in Sardinia, Volvo 65s in Spain, and the future of the America's Cup is revealed.